New security laws allow Japanese forces to fight overseas for the first time since World War II. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. The change in policy is the biggest shift in Japan's defense posture in more than 70 years. The Japanese laws lift a decades-old self-imposed ban on collective self-defense. We begin with this report from CCTV's John Gilmore. With the approval of the new security laws, Japan is now allowed to defend allies, even when the country itself is not under attack. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says the legislation is vital to meet new global challenges. Right now around the world, no nation can protect itself alone. So this security law helps create a stronger deterrent and prevents wars before they happen. Public reaction has been mixed. In Tokyo, thousands of people took to the streets in protest, and there have been calls for the Prime Minister's resignation. No matter what list of reason Abe gave, or conditions that he promised an exercise in the collective self-defense, it means the same thing. Japan is ready to take arms and become a country that will participate in war. Several scholars have questioned the constitutionality of these laws. China and neighboring countries strongly object to Japan's change in policy. We hope that the Japanese side will draw lessons from history, stick to the path of peaceful development, handle prudently its military and security policies, and do more to enhance mutual trust with neighboring countries, contributing to peace and stability in the region. John Gilmore, CCTV News. Joining us now from Portland is Takasato Watanabe. He's a professor emeritus at Doshisha University in Japan. From Beijing, we're joined by senior captain Zhang Junxie. He's the vice president of China's Naval Research Institute. Also from Beijing is Yoshikazu Kato. He's a columnist for the New York Times Chinese Web Edition and an author. And here with us in our Washington, D.C. studio is An Zhang Lim. She's a lecturer on career studies at Johns Hopkins University. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Takasato, according to these new laws, what they tell us is that Japan can now exercise its right to collective self-defense. What does that mean? What's changed? So far, self-defense forces was considered, considered to defend Japan only as the individual defense right. However, new laws, security-related laws this time, it made the, all the behaviors of militarily speaking for the Japanese government to do the military actions together with the United States, especially. So this is a collective defense right. Japanese constitution does not permit the collective defense right so far. So Mr. Minister, Prime Minister Abe changed the understanding of that clause. So this is the first one. Second one that self-defense forces of Japan have not been considered not to going outside of Japan, but recently it made possible for self-defense forces to go operation together with the, even the Vietnam sea areas. So this is typically the example changing the military forces operation of Japan. Junshe, as we mentioned in our report just a moment ago, there are several neighboring countries that have expressed strong objections to Japan's change in policy. What are China's concerns over this defense policy change? Well, <clears throat> I think China and its neighboring countries are wor very much worried about the possibility of a re revival of militarism uh, in Japan, just as the case before World War II, because the change of security laws of Japan have violated the spirit of the Pacific Constitution of Japan, which was drafted by the United States after the 
end of, after the end of World War II. Uh, the Pacific Constitution does not allow the Japanese armed forces to go abroad and fight a war overseas. But through the changes of these uh, security laws, in the future, the Japanese armed forces will be allowed to operate and fight overseas. Considering the fact that, the, that Japan has never made sincere reflections on its past, especially its atrocities and crimes committed during World War II, and these crimes uh, inflicted much casualties on China and its neighboring countries. So China and other Asian, uh, uh, Asian countries are very much afraid of the revival of militarism in Japan through this change of uh, security law. Kato, those who oppose the new measures are calling it war legislation. Uh, is China justified in expressing its fears and its concerns over this change in the Japanese law? Uh, yes, I think, uh, first of all, this uh, new security law, this is strength seeking to strengthen the Japan-U.S. alliance uh, in this region. I think it's really important for uh, what's going to be happening in Japanese future foreign policy. I think now this security law is under controversy, great controversy in Japan. Uh, so I think now for Prime Minister Abe, uh, there will be a great challenge to convince uh, both domestic politics and international community because uh, because of some historic events now, uh, Japan is, uh, Japan is uh, facing a great challenges, including some regional uh, challenges, including the rise of China. So now, uh, I think now, strategically speaking, now Shinzo Abe is trying to do something more in this region. But at the same time, now a lot of oppositions are happening right now as well in Japanese society. So I think now for, the, for his next step, I think how to convince his, you know, Japanese public opinion and at, and, and at the same time, how to you know, convince the international community. So I think now uh, we still need to wait and see and what's going to happen next. And Zhang, how is South Korea viewing the uh, changes in Japan? You know, um, South Korea, of course, North Korea too, but we did experience the colonial rule. Uh, so that uh, creates kind of big uh, historic trauma among the Korean people. So even though um, there can be some necessity, uh, uh, again, necessity of, of further collaboration, military collaboration with the Japanese uh, self-defense force, for any case, um, kind of, you know, contingency in the Korean Peninsula, but still at the same time, people cannot completely um, trust Japan's intention. So that's actually a big problem. And uh, that is why sometimes um, politicians uh, utilize this kind of anxiety, uh, or uh, even media also sometimes try to stimulate uh, that kind of anger or um, uh, sometimes fear uh, among the Korean people. But um, still at the same time, uh, there are other experts or policy uh, makers who are very cautious at the same time want to be pragmatic. So again, as I mentioned, uh, for any contingency case in the Korean Peninsula, we might need to. We might need to collaborate with the uh, uh, Japanese Self-Defense Force as well. So there are some voices, more like the rational or pragmatic voices, uh, to suggest uh, you know, we need to uh, deepen the di discussions on the scenario, or we need to um, um, the deepen, again, the negotiations with the Japan as well uh, to set up like a guideline for every possible scenario. So, yes. so when you say that there are pragmatic voices, are you mm -hmm. saying that there are elements in South Korea which are saying, well, okay, mm -hmm. we can deal with this, we can accept it? Uh, of course, there can, you know, uh, South Korea is a liberal society, so there are many different voices. Some people will be very anxious about uh, right. the situations, but, uh, you know, of course, they are not uh, representing the whole population. So I'm trying to say, you know, there are several different voices, and uh, if you more focus on the government side, I think they, of course, they need to be cautious, but at the same time, I don't think uh, uh, they want to reject whatever this kind of, you know, changes. Uh, that occurred in Japan. Mm -hmm. Takasato, Japan's Prime Minister refers to a Japan-United States alliance. Uh, Shinzo Abe says the two countries will now be able to defend each other. Uh, is it likely that Japan could be drawn into conflicts in which the U.S. is involved, where the U.S. is leading a confrontation with another country? Japan could be called upon to assist in that. Definitely, yes, literally. However, 
uh, for the time being, there's not big possibility of being involved in that. More, more than that, United States idea is to have Japan to be against China as hypothetical enemy. That's the first one. Second one is that if the attention of the world and also in Asian countries people comes to the South East China Sea. This means that tension is existing in this area and then United States can draw some troops from Middle East to the Asian area to be against China. So Israeli will be very happy because the Middle East countries will be put into more turmoils. This kind of the complex, you see, operation politically being made by the United States together with the Abe administration. Mr. Abe is not so uh, well informed in those things, but United States is planning to do that, I believe. Junche, China and Japan have been holding talks on security issues. The Chinese foreign ministry, in fact, said that these talks, and they described it as an important channel of communications between the defense and diplomatic departments uh, of the two countries. Uh, now when we look at these changes taking place in Japan, are they likely to pose a setback to those talks? Uh, yes, uh, to some extent we can say that uh, the, changes, uh, the changes of the security policies of Japan have uh, given setback in the uh, Sino-Japan relationship. It, because we know that the fact is that uh, the Pacific Constitution of Japan has guaranteed the peace and stability in this region for 70 years and has also guaranteed the economic growth and prosperity of Japan for 70 years. But now Japan wants to change uh, its constitution and this is very dangerous. And from, through the process of the changes of the security laws of Japan, we can see two phenomena that are very dangerous. First is that uh, some of the Abe administration officials have constantly denied the history during World War II, especially the Japanese atrocities it committed during World War II. For instance, Japan uh, some of the high-ranking officials of the Abe administration have denied the fact the 19 massacre which killed more than 300,000 Chinese uh, in Nanjing. And so this is very dangerous to, China, to the Chinese. Second, uh, through the process of the change, uh, change of the security laws, the Japanese uh, are improving, developing their military capabilities very fast. They have set up specialized force uh, for amphibious operations uh, against the Joey Island, against China. And uh, they, are, uh, they are exercising uh, the operations, uh, the amphibious operations uh, tactics uh, against China uh, at the, under the cover of the uh, Joey Island. Uh, so these kind of things have uh, reminded China and also other Asian countries of the uh, atrocities the Japanese imperialists committed during World War II. So if the Japanese government, the high-ranking officials, do not make sincere reflections on their crimes during World War II, the Asian countries cannot be sure about their future. Kato, there are many ways of looking at uh, these changes that are taking place in Japan. Of course, Japan says that this reinterpretation of the Constitution is uh, about collective self-defense. There are others, and these are critics, say that Shinzo Abe is a nationalist, and what we are seeing now in Japan is evidence of that nationalism. To what extent is nationalism playing a role in this? Yeah, I think now, I think uh, this is a problem, this is a problem of nationalism, but uh, I do not think now, uh, because of the passing, the passing the new security law, that's why now you know, Japanese nationalism is rising up. I do not think so. Probably now for, for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, this would be a great you know, national goal uh, to seek some so-called normal country. 
for this, probably you know the new security law would be a very important process for Shinzo Abe's uh, political you know goal. But I think you know how the Japanese public opinion see the Prime Minister Abe's this goal. I think this should be you know really carefully thinking about because uh, as I mentioned, a lot of Japanese citizens are opposing that. And looking at some poll, the you know, public opinion, um, I, I think uh, around half Japanese citizens are opposing. You know what is what what now the Shinzo Prime Minister Abe is doing right now. So I think you know we should you know see this problem separately now. Our politician, including Prime Minister Abe, is seeking some normal country through passing the new security law. And of course, in this process now, he is trying to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance and enhancing Japanese influence in this region. But how the Japanese public opinion, uh, you know, always you know, related with the nationalism or rise of nationalism, are what's going to happen on this issue. I think we should see this issue very separately. Otherwise, you know, it's very hard to understand what's what, what, what is happening right now in Japan. Okay, we are going to have to take a break right now, and this is when we say goodbye to Yoshikazu Kato. Thanks for your contribution uh, to this show. Our other three guests remain with us. More of our conversation about Japan's security laws right after this. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. Welcome back to The Heat. We're discussing Japan's new security laws and the reaction from the international community. Let's get back to our panel. And Zan, let me start with you this time. There has been criticism in South Korea uh, over Japan's policies. This criticism goes back a long way. It concerns Japan's occupation of the Korean Peninsula. It concerns Japan's treatment of the Korean people, especially Korean women. Do you think that relations are likely to deteriorate even further now? Um, as you know, uh, intergovernment, I think uh, basically um, um, if you ask me that kind of question, I think it depends on which level we are talking about. Again, uh, South Korea is a liberal society, so if you more focus on the intergovernmental level, again, uh, it was a hard decision, it was, but uh, they agreed on the, uh, uh, the comfort women issues last December, even though they didn't get a kind of strong support, um, neither, neither from the Japanese people nor the Korean people. But still, it was, uh, um, again, the agreement between the governments. So if you more focus on the, that kind of intergovernmental relationship, I don't think this kind of change can damage fundamentally mm -hmm. the relationship between the two governments. But again, uh, if you go back to like um, people's level or media, if so, there are still concerns. So my uh, biggest concern is uh, what if, you know, other like a reckless or irritating remarks uh, can be done by, um, by Japanese politicians uh, who can be pretty far right. If so, it can amplify all this, you know, kind of backlash or anxiety among the people, among the South Korean people. So that's my um, hypothetical concern. But so far, I don't think, uh, you know, it's going to be deteriorating dramatically from now. Mm -hmm. But among the South Korean mm -hmm. people, uh, do you have any, any indication of what public opinion is like on this particular issue? I mean, what is the media in South Korea reporting Again, we do have a long, a wide range between yeah. the, uh, uh, even between the media. Mm -hmm. Some more like a conservative, political conservative media, yeah. media will, uh, of course, they will also present uh, their own concerns, but at the same time, they want to be more pragmatic. You know, if we need to uh, get some collaboration from the, even from the Japanese self-defense force, why not, right? That kind of position. At the right. same time, uh, the progressive group or more like opposition group of people will will uh, show their deeper anxiety. We can never trust, probably, uh, the real intention of the Japanese self-defense force uh, or Japanese government. So there's no clear kind of consensus-like uh, voice about uh, this specific issue. So I think a more bigger concern, probably, as other panelists pointed out, uh, the rivalry uh, between the China and uh, Japan, that can be a kind of bigger concern for us as well, because it can be beyond our control. Right. So that's our, yeah. That's, uh, to be honest, I think that's a more uh, bigger concern, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Takasato, Japan says that this is not a change to its constitution, its pacifist constitution, that it is a reinterpretation of clauses in that constitution. But despite that assurance, uh, there are some who believe that it's Shinzo Abe's ultimate aim to change the constitution. 
Do you believe that to be the case? Yeah, uh, this July, we have the election for the upper house, possibly together with the down, you see, uh, lower house uh, represent representatives. And Abe administration, especially he himself, want to have two thirds majority in the diet, upper and lower, both. If it is realized for him, he wants to easily change the understanding, not only understanding of the Constitution, but the phrasing, wording of the Constitution. But recently, the supporting rate for the LDP is only a bit more than 40%. Uh, Japan TV's is the public uh, poll, 41%. And also Asahi Mainichi newspapers, most, you see, most of those uh, national newspapers, just a bit more 40%. So it is very difficult for Ad Abe administration to change the constitution. But actually, he wants to change it because he wants to be the great politician following his grandfather who made a new security pact with the, with the United States in 1960. Junshui, the Japanese say one of the reasons for the changes to these laws is a rising China. Does Japan have anything to fear from China? I think uh, this is absolutely not true. Uh, the so-called China threat has been used by Japan to uh, as an excuse to cover its real aim and intention behind the changes to its security laws and also the development of military capabilities of Japan. We know that during the last two or three decades, uh, the Japanese have been dry, striving to become a normal country. What is a normal country? To their, uh, uh, to their thinking, or uh, in their opinion, that now Japan is not a normal country because it cannot, it does not have the right to send its forces to operate and fight overseas. And so, through uh, the changes of this law, uh, Japan will become a no normal country, uh, which can deploy its uh, armed forces abroad and fight a war, even if. Japan is not attacked itself. So uh, this is the real reason for the exchange of the security laws of Japan. But they are not to tell the truth to the world. So they use the so-called China threat as a cover, as an excuse. Uh, so we don't think this is the case. Aung San, there could be all kinds of fallout from these uh, Japanese actions. Uh, there could be an arms race in that part of the world. There could be heightened tensions. Um, but is it likely that this could lead to some kind of new Cold War in that region? Again, that's my concern. I think uh, many other South Korean folks are also concerned about that kind of situation. Again, as I mentioned, for probably North Korea related things, we might need to collaborate with anybody probably who can help our situations. So probably for that specific goal, we can be more flexible or pragmatic or rational. But again, the rivalry or escalations between the regional powers up to whatever those level, uh, it cannot be um, that control by ourselves. If so, it's going to be a real concern for us. And the South Korea, from its um, from the sizes, I mean, the physical conditions point of view, it's almost impossible for us. I mean, the, to catch up with all these giant-like uh, countries. So we definitely don't want to see uh, the kind of you know escalations among the regional power. Yes. Uh, Takasado, there seems to be a disconnect between what the Japanese government has been doing and the way the Japanese people feel. Uh, their opinion polls would show that more than half of Japan's population is opposed to this new legislation. So why has Prime Minister Abe been so determined to push it through in Parliament? Yes, uh, new, newly made uh, public polls, it asked mainly two things. The first one is that uh, Abenomics, Abeno economy planning, and then newly made security related laws. Uh, but actually, 
the people of Japan may be, it may be the same to other people. If the living standard is coming up and up, it is okay. However, Abenomics is in failure. So just supporting rate became low from 70 of the two years ago to the 41 or 42 uh, percent. Now, this means that Abenomics in failure and also the young mothers who have the, the young children, they realized the some failure of Abenomics, Abeno economy, and they are afraid of having their children into the battlefield. So Japanese people, especially women, young women, came to be educated by his administration. That, ironically, it is very good. Junshui, Japan is one of uh, China's biggest trading partners. How will uh, these new security laws on the part of Japan affect their economic relationship, relationship if, if at all? Well, I think uh, the Chinese government, on one hand, wants, uh, is waiting for the Japanese government to take a correct attitude uh, toward uh, its past uh, history and also toward the development of, chi of China and also refrain from changing its pacific constitution and remain on the path of peaceful development. On the other hand, uh, the Chinese government has been uh, taking great effort to improve the economic relationship between the two sides because we think that the economic the relationship, especially the, the improvement of this relationship, uh, serves uh, the interests of the two peoples, both China and Japan. And the uh, economic relationship will improve the life of the two countries, the, the peoples. So we think uh, we should push forward the economic relationship between our two countries, especially be, uh, the exchanges between our two peoples. Uh, this is different uh, from the economic uh, relationship uh, because we can see that many uh, Japanese people are against the changes of the security policies pushed forward by Mr. Abe. So there are a difference between the government and the people. So we should push forward the economic relationship between our two countries. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV underscore America. I'm Arlen Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.